My name is Amelia Moreau. I live in Providence, Rhode Island with my mom. My grandpa used to live with us in the apartment above the garage. He kept to himself a lot up there. I remember hearing him type away on his typewriter when my friends and I played soccer in the yard. It was his sanctuary. He died earlier this year. Even though he was old and not doing so well, a part of me assumed he would live forever. His death was tough. Even though Grandpa and Mom rarely saw eye to eye, I think his death was harder on her. She never wanted to talk about it. She just wanted to handle all of his things herself. Nearly half a year passed, and she hadn't even opened the door to his apartment. I knew he loved to write. I knew he loved to tell stories. And I knew he had really cool glasses. But he never told me his story about life before I knew him. Neither did Mom. I was not prepared for what I would find. Mom taught me to be independent and strong. It's why she's my hero. But I couldn't quite make sense of these discoveries. And I realized very quickly I couldn't do this on my own. So I reached out for help. And I got help immediately from the most amazing people. I did not expect this. Hello, all you dreamers, optimists, and junior tomorrow knots. Welcome to the Tomorrowland Times podcast, the unofficial home for fans of Disney's 2015 Tomorrowland movie, its prequel novel Before Tomorrowland, and of special importance today, the alternate reality game that introduced us to its fictional universe all the way back in 2013, The Optimist. For the 10th anniversary of that groundbreaking experience, I am thrilled to be chatting with one of its contributors, writer, experience designer, and creative director Chad Jones. I first met him when he was a game designer on the dusty trails of Legends of Frontierland, and now he's the principal show writer for Universal Destinations and Experiences Creative Studio. Chad, thank you for joining me on this reverie, and happy 10th Optimist anniversary. Oh, God. Can you believe it's been 10 years? No, I can't. When you first texted me that, like, it legitimately blew my mind. It, it's so ingrained in my brain. It's surreal that it's been that long. And it has the uh, distinction of being one of the very few things that I did at Disney that I can actually talk about. Because I was, was with WDIR and D, so much of the work we did will never be seen by humans. Like so much of it is sitting on a shelf and so much of it um, either led to other things or didn't. And that's the kind of nature of the beast and just the nature of the sort of exper experimental things that we were doing. And I'm just so glad that the optimist like made it where it did and, and really excited that, you know, that we can talk about it. On that note, why don't we go all the way back? Let's go back more than 10 years. Okay. Paint a picture for us. Where was Chad Jones just before The Optimist came into his life? What was your career looking like at that time, all the way back in pre-2013 days? Whoa. Well, I'm going to take a bit of a step further back. Please. Because theme parks was like never a real goal of mine. It was never a real professional aspiration it just kind of happened like i grew up in the middle of nowhere tennessee where becoming an imaginary working in theme parks a kid would dream of the same level you would dream of becoming an astronaut or batman like there was just no actual there was no way to do this and and, and so like i was talking to a class at ucf and they said well when did you know you want to do this i'm like i didn't it just happened but i was always kind of a creative kid i was always drew and wrote and went to school for graphic design, got my first job in advertising out of, out of school. And that was kind of my first career. My first career was as production artist and art director. And eventually was working for this really small shop that had Honda power equipment as a client. And so I did ads for lawnmowers and generators and outboard motors and engines and like not like not even the sexy Honda, but just the ancillary Honda things. And I kind of burned out doing it. It was a very tough creative experience. It was a very tough job. And I kind of had this epiphany that everything I was doing in my life, I was doing for things that people were trying to avoid. They were changing the channel. They were flipping the page. And I just had this sort of existential crisis of, do I want to keep doing this? 
And so my wife and I were kind of looking at our lives. And I think two weeks after I had left the agency to go freelance, my wife lost her job at the Shop at Home Network. And we were kind of looking at our lives and going, well, what do we do? We kind of decided that if we didn't take a stab at Hollywood, that we never would. So I had been writing commercials and it taken a hand at screenwriting and had placed in a few contests and my wife was studying film at a school in Nashville and we decided to move to LA. We put our house on the market and it sold like literally weeks before the entire economy collapsed. Oh, wow. And we made it to LA. I found freelance work pretty quickly and Carrie did some work at some studios and I kind of fell bass backwards in the comic book industry. And so I was working for a small entertainment company and we were developing multiple different comic books and graphic novels and web series. When the investor ran out of money, I was literally looking for any job that had the word creative in it, like Photoshop, writing, creative. And I came across this ad on Craigslist. So if anyone asked me how I got into theme park design, the answer is Craigslist. <laughs> Still valid still, advice. It, it's, it's like, I don't know how this happened. It just did. And so I, I applied to this job that sounded exceedingly boring. It sounded like front-end web design, creative oversight of projects, vendor management, three-month contracts. Didn't even know who it was for. So I interviewed with a headhunter, and I then went. Then they said it was for Disney's WD Pro, uh, Parsons Resorts Online, and I'm like, yeah, I need a job. I'll, I'll literally do anything. I, I, I have bills to pay. And I remember meeting Steve Tatum, who was the creative director for what was called the Events Projects team at WD Pro. This was like experimental phone apps and how they'd intersect with theme parks and specialty websites. And he showed me some stuff they had done in conjunction with Imagineering for T. Rowe Price and, and Epcot. And I literally remember sitting up straight in the interview thinking, this is actually interesting. I should pay attention. And <laughs> <laughs> Wake up. Time to wake up. <laughs> and, and because, because it was like, I didn't, I walked in, I didn't have any expectations. Like, all right, I'll, I guess I'll design some websites if they like me well enough. And it, what it wound up being was this job that was, for all intents and purposes, the R&D division of WD Pro. And so they were doing all these really funky projects and they were working with really, these really cool designers and they were really, these real cool companies. And they were partnering with Imagineering on working on some stuff. It was supposed to be this like this three month gig at the end of their quarter. And then we, they were going to let me go and that was going to go off into the world. But, but I really took a shine to it and really enjoyed the work. And I remember my first assignment was for the very first D23, I was doing a mobile trivia game where we were hiding these hidden Mickeys throughout the throughout the convention, and then you text in and the answer back and forth. And I remember getting the brief from Steve and going into his office, and I'm like, okay, I've never done anything like this, but I'm okay with that if you're okay with that. And then we're off to the races. But I wanted contracting for the company for another year or so. They hired me on as a full-time creative lead, and we were kind of like doing more and more work with WDI. And one day our director came in and started handing everyone Imagineering notebooks and said, congratulations, you're all Imagineers. We're all being picked up and organizationally moving to R&D. And I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. Well, I'll just check that childhood dream off, I guess. <laughs> How casually it was introduced to you, this idea. <laughs> and, so, and so it just kind of happened. Um, but, but it's like, it took all these skills I'd built up over the years of, you know, working in advertising and working in comics and just being this sort of journeyman creative dude. And I like to say they use all these skills for good instead of evil. And, and so like when we moved to R and D, we started looking at, you know, more experimental storytellings and ways to use technology in the parks and the optimist came up. This was a couple of years into my stint at R&D. And I remember I had tried to pitch something similar. Like I, I thought ARDs were interesting and I, and I had another pitch for another movie that was coming out and they kind of rejected it because they already, this was already kind of in the works. And a couple months later, they came to me and said, okay, so the Optimus is getting real and we need to actually start putting some meat on the bone. 
So it had been in discussions for a while before you were actually brought on. Yeah. So, but it, but it was definitely in the, in the wheelhouse of things that I was interested in as far as like just alternate storytelling and, you know, multimedia, multimedia platforms. And it was just kind of, it was just kind of interesting. Like, how do you tell a story in that way? It was a thing that I hadn't done before. So that was one of the reasons it was very appealing to me. So when I came on board, they had already been in talks with pictures and had already kind of had this sort of high level notion of what they wanted the experience to be. And they had kind of a rough outline and they had a rough timeline, but they didn't have a lot of the specifics figured out. I was kind of brought on board to kind of help shape some of those specifics and help do some of the narrative design and do some puzzle design and do some of the development of it. I was kind of like the guy they went to if they needed help. And so I helped. You know, having this sort of weird art copy background and some really specific game design with relation to theme park stuff. Like I just had, I said blast with it. And I was very glad they were, they brought me on board because, you know, we got to help shape the story and we got to help get into the weeds of who Amelia was and what her, what she was going to discover and how the story would unfold. How much of her was there at that point? Like, was there already a framing character? Did they say there's this young girl, she's going to find a box or was that even kind of fuzzy at that point? I think they had decided upon her as the framing device for the experience. And I think they had decided upon, you know, this relationship with her grandfather is kind of the emotional core of it and going through his materials and sort of discovering his ties to this project and his ties to the conspiracy and his ties to this underlying story of Imagineering as part of the sort of plus ultra Bradberg vision of what it was. What I remember from the early sessions I was brought in was the grandfather was a much, I'm not going to say dark, I'm going to say grim. It was, it was a much grimmer figure. He wrote obituaries and work for the newspaper and i was like well that's not fun nobody wants to write that <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i mean i think from himself she's like well you know just looking at the time frame like he would have written in the tale of the golden age of science fiction and that's kind of what we're talking about so why don't we go in that direction you wrote the titular orbit's story of story orbit the screenplay excerpt right i i did um so you got to use yeah. some of your screenwriting chops in, a, in a project like this. And, and, I, and I vaguely remember like going back to like an old Billy Wilder script from the 50s to look at the, some of the formatting differences between modern day and and then. Don't remember the specific screenplay, but I do remember I was like, I want to look up a Billy Wilder script just for fun. And I think what's, what was really interesting is that we I wrote that and then we gave it to one of our associate producers and she got a manual typewriter to type it out. Wow. And we told her, don't worry about the mistakes. We'll mark it up and it'll look real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then people went looking for clues in, in the mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, sir, that is the most predictable outcome. Uh, I didn't. Could, no, there could we're, possibly we're, be. We're just trying to get stuff done. And it was always like, oh, yeah, of course they would do that. Of course they would think there's a clues there. <laughs> Why didn't we think of that? Because we didn't. Yeah. And we're very busy. Uh, <laughs> but, that, but that was a lot of fun. And just trying to get that sort of like hint of the hint of what was to come just sort of highlighted in that stuff. That was a lot of fun to work on. That was a screenplay that Carlos had done, but I actually did write the short story. I did write hmm. the actual story over that Walton would have bought. Hmm. Um, and we never found a place for it in the experience. Really? And it just like, if we couldn't fit in the timeline or we, it, we got we set it aside. It was too late, and but I remember writing writing that sort of like golden age of science fiction style uh, style story that went that went along with the project, and, and so I, I think that was my big contribution to how the story shaped from that. And I guess I do a lot of really I'm not gonna say weird things, but. I, I remember working on those early blogs of Amelia's and working on some of those letters that he got from Disney and working on working on just various bits and pieces of the project that 
that kind of fit the sort of greater vision of what they had in mind. I would write it, someone would take the copy and design it to look like a letter or design it to look like a telegraph or design it to look like whatever. And I think they actually found some some old letterhead from that era and then printed printed it on that once they had designed it, printed it on that letterhead and then shot it. A lot of people had a hand in this. And I think where the ad that Wallace had in the program. Yes, yeah, like, for the finale. Yeah, so that that puzzle was basically just circles and text. And then we handed that just handed it to an art director and then they would actually design it and design the little icons and design the, the look and feel of it. And did you design that puzzle? Yes. Excellent. The Excellent. password is progress. Is that? <laughs> right. And it's so that Wallace would know who was really in the game, yeah. you know, versus versus who just wandered up to the booth, right? <laughs> oh, well, we had we had people in line that saw the ad and decided that was the, that's where they started. So that, that, that particular puzzle had to serve two functions, both as the acknowledgement for those that have been playing and an entry point for people that were just coming into for, for the first time. And so the actor basically had two broad spiels that he would give, one to people that were in the game, one to people that were not. Together, we discovered that Grandpa was part of something big, that he worked for a legend, that he was associated with a society of revolutionary thinkers. Together, we found evidence of great projects being worked on, innovations ahead of their time, ahead of our time, and Grandpa was a part of that. Thing that is so difficult for people to imagine when you describe this to them 10 years later is that unlike every other alternate reality game that tied into a film, this was not, people call it a promotional exercise, but the fact that this occurred two years before the film came out and then honestly before the filming had even begun, the filming wouldn't even start till after the finale had occurred. Um, it's hard to describe this as a promotional thing because Disney never actually officially confirmed that they talked to each other. What was your sense internally of like, what are we trying to get out of this? Is Was it purely experimental or was there kind of a, a, a double attempt, at, you know, trying to do both promotion and experimentation? I can't speak to what sparked the project. Um, what I can speak to is... Um, there was definitely an R and D spirit of let's figure this out. Let's, let's learn from this. Let's, you know, sort of push the envelope of what this type of experience can be. Um, and, and, and I think it was, um, it just personally very gratifying. I think the fact that we're still talking about it 10 years later, that is astonishing. Um, I, I think the reaction has been extremely gratifying and very, very moving for me, like very, very gratifying. Something worked on could have, it could have that kind of impact because I certainly didn't get that writing lawnmower commercials. My mom had a tough time accepting what I was doing, sharing everything I knew about grandpa. As much as mom wanted to avoid dealing with grandpa, I knew, like so many of my new friends, that she had to see what we had all found out about him. That all of his work was for her. When you first were told about The Optimist, obviously they already knew this bears some relation to this film that's eventually going to be shot. It hadn't been shot yet. Were you allowed to read a script or was it really just meetings of verbally being explained to you? What, what were you allowed to know about the movie? Mm, I personally wasn't. Um, others might have had more insight into it. I think the only thing that I knew working on it was how it connected to the World's Fair and how it connected to Walt. And and I think when I finally saw the film, like it, it, it was a very narrow sliver of what we were drawing from for that experience. And so I personally didn't know much other than what I was told. Amber Samdahl, who was the creative director of that, might have seen a script. Uh, Sarah Thatcher, who was a great producer on that, might have seen the script, but I don't think I ever did. I, I, I only ever remember reading one script for features while I was there, and it was not related to this. Being aware of the small sliver of the movie's mythology that you guys had to play with, 
Yeah. Do you remember there being like specific edicts like we probably can't say the word plus ultra, but we can use the logo or for example, we probably shouldn't say Wallace is a robot. <laughs> <laughs> was that was that on your gut? Like, because I have to assume internally he was a robot, right? Uh, I think, he, I yeah, I I, I, th- I think we need to go and say it. We were playing with it. Like, do we hint at it? Do we? Is it real? Is it not? And, and I think there was like one tweet that I wrote where he says like, like I'm an art making machine. Everyone was like, yep, he's a robot. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that guy. Some kind of advanced animatronic. Once you see the film, he kind of can't be anything but a robot. Yeah. Side note, did you ever hear any of the really weird stuff that uh Lindelof and Bird wanted to do after The Optimist? Like No, I've not. I interviewed them both. Oh really? And of course, I'm mostly talking about the movie. But I always ask about the optimist. Oh, yeah. It was kind of what they were, what they were aware of, you know, because to them it was just a glimpse into their world, right? That's how they thought of it. But apparently, there was this degree of the the movie guys don't understand actually how hard it is to make something like this. So they were pitching blue sky stuff like we want the Mister Lincoln animatronic to wig out and start giving a plus ultra monologue during great moments you know you know what i mean like stuff, like stuff like that like just clearly indicating that it's like okay i this is, these are fun ideas right but it's like there's that's just not gonna happen something like that is not gonna happen you know no. like you can take you can curate people up to club 33 you can do these activations you can have wallace talking in front of lincoln but actually changing the animatronic right. probably not in scope of this project i think I was there when you guys went to Club 33. Uh, we were backstage nearby. I think I wrote his spiel for the Lincoln thing, but I don't think I was there. I assume you did a lot of work with Wallace. Because yeah. he was also, a, other than Amelia, he was the one that was going to be physically interacting with the characters. So he had several live appearances. He had the live stream interview with Bob Gurr that was done on his website, right? So I assume there was just a lot of writing to do. Oh, yeah. We were constantly going back and forth and handing things off. I would say that I, at most, I worked on a third of it. Yeah. At most. Uh, I wrote some of the early blogs for Amelia. I wrote some of the early tweets for Amelia. Uh, I handle the Wallace uh, Twitter account. I remember the Bob Gurr interview. I think I was next to Bob <laughs> when that happened. <laughs> Just so we can give people some of their flowers. Do you remember who some of those other writers were that you were working on the project with? Yeah, the, the J- Joe Lemoyne uh, did a lot of the heavy lifting with Amelia's blog and, and her Twitter feed. He was the other primary writer that I worked with. But just let's you know give credit where credit's due. I think I mentioned Amber Samdahl, who's the creative director for the project, and Sarah Thatcher, who was the creative producer. Uh, Chris Muller, who came in to help produce the all the finale materials at D23. Uh, Jared Lance, who's one of the art directors. And in lack of, and just all the people that that helped and all the people that pitched in. Right. And I'm assuming the only reason it exists in the first place is because Trowbridge wanted it to happen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, I mean, that, it, it's one of those ones where it's like they're not just going to do this. You know, yeah. this, this, is, this is not just a project that it emerges intuitively. This, this yeah. kind of thing kind of has to be willed into existence. Yeah, it was just this. It was just this wild bit of storytelling that we got to play with, and yeah. and I think that I, I I had a blast doing it. One of the big appeals of this was was getting to try something new and getting to play in this different sandbox. And like, how do you tell a story where part of it is through? Like, I remember this construction website that we did, and I remember writing this. FAQ because there was an email and people were asking questions. Lot family construction. Crap, I forgot about that. And I remember there, there was like we handed off to some people that I don't remember who, who did it, but every once in a while I would get it, I would get questions from them that were not in the FAQ and I would, I would have to answer them. So you were doing some live support as well as the pre-writing stuff. Oh yeah, because you know half of these games there's the pre-planning and then half of it is once the game goes live. 
you've got players who are, you know, going through it and there's, there's going to be some unexpected uh, things, including as I've learned, 100%. Amelia's mother as, and you tell me if this is your memory of how this played out. I was told okay. that Amelia's mother coming to D23 was not part of the original plan. It was basically the players almost willed it to occur. That tracks, that tracks with, with, with what I remember. I think for my part, I, I feel like I had, I feel like I worked a lot on the, on the start of it. And I feel like I worked a lot on the end of it and, a, and here and there in the middle stuff. And you were definitely on site during D23, right? I, I think I remember oh, that. Yeah, I was, I was at Wall, I was one of Wallace's booth attendants. That's right. That's and right. And every once in a while he was signaling to ask me a question. The Optimist finale was at the D23 2013 Expo, right? Yes. And this was also when the movie kind of had its coming out party. And so yes. you had your guys' finale occurring, but you also had this Tomorrowland booth for the film where they were showing off the 1952 box. Do you remember any discussions about, we got to make sure these things are separate, or was it just by nature of them being made by different people? Do you remember anything about that that kind of connectivity with the with the film? Personally, no. I, I think one of the things one of the things that we have to consider is just how fast we were moving at that time, and right. how right. how exhausted we were. Right now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember my boss going. I was like at the booth, and he's like, "Go home. Go 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 to your room. Get some sleep." I don't remember there being specific discussions about the booth. I think m- my focus was is the poster there did the did the pamphlets show up or like did the posters look okay we had one guy who did not understand that it was a game and kept harassing the booth that i had to <laughs> had to deal with that guy so it, it, it was it was pretty hectic that weekend um and a lot of my focus like i think i did a lot of the puzzle and game design for the stuff that happened in the convention center. Right, right, right. I think it did a couple of pieces in the in park finale. By any chance, did you work on the Lily Bell card puzzle from the finale? Uh, yeah, I think that was one of the pieces I did when, uh, that was actually part of the in park stuff. A lot of the, in, a lot of the in park stuff I was aware of, but didn't have direct hands on, but I think that was one of the things that I did. Did you contribute to any of the, um, they called them the waltz haunts, the stuff around LA that wasn't in the parks? This is where my memory gets fuzzy because I remember as a team, we went to Chili Jones for lunch. (laughs) 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 Well, and honestly, it's the only place of those haunts where they still have a little photo of the optimist can and the message and the secret message inside. And everything. Good. The Tam O'Shanter took down the Wallace poster after 10 oh, years. My, uh, it, it almost made it 10 years. Passages. Obviously uh, the carvings in the table are still there. Cause those, those aren't going anywhere, but that, that I, those two pieces I worked on and those are some of the early, some of the early things. Um, and I remember distinctly one of the, God, I don't remember who, but one of them was like, so Walt and his buddies went to the table shanter? We're like, yeah. And they screwed up a table? I'm like, kind of. <laughs> hey. Hey, this is this is the cost of admission. This is the barrier to entry for this type of storytelling. Yeah. Is people are gonna write down a lot more than they usually would. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they're gonna they're gonna embed into uh the wood there. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Did you guys have much time to play test these aspects of the game? I remember going through like multiple like the like the, the brochures and stuff. Like we went through a lot of iterations of those to make sure those worked and went through a lot of iterations of just mechanically people like putting their things together or holding holding them up to different posters in the thing or trying to align them to the blueprints in in the displays. Well we did we did a lot of like just testing there but we never had an opportunity to like go run through the entire thing. Like it, it was testing in bits and pieces and, you know, trusting in the design enough that it would work on the day and knocking on whatever substrate we could find. <laughs> Do you remember anything that you really wish you wanted to get in, but just it, logistically or budget wise, you couldn't get into the Optimus? Personally, the thing that, the thing that I wish we'd gotten in there was that Carl short story was that, initial thing that sort of got him on Walt's radar, radar that sort of, it was really about this 
young child trying to connect with the spirit of their father that had passed. And it really tied into the mom story and really tied into that. That's what I remember about it. And that's what I kind of wish we had feared a way to get in. I was really proud of it. It just, we couldn't find a place for it. I want to ask you about the legacy of this project, not just for yourself, which you've spoken to so well, but like the the next things you worked on and, 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 and both at Disney and otherwise, what do you see as the legacy of this that was, that was carried forward? Oh God, this is going to sound really, really plucky. And I don't mean for it to, um, but this experience led to me writing a screenplay called Redacted. Hmm. And, and it was really about the process of creating a thing like this, about creating an R and an ARG type experience, but set in the world of UFO conspiracies. And, and so, and where my dark brain went when, when the project was happening, everyone's having this really positive response was, well, okay, well, what if we did this and it really ruined people's lives? Right. And, <laughs> And it can. I mean, that's the, and, that is the potential. That is the the awesome power of this kind of thing. And, and so, like, so there are nod, like, nods in, in the screenplay that was basically about constructing a nonlinear story and how you adapt to people reacting to it and what you have to do to kind of stay ahead of it and how nimble you have to be yeah. and how agile you have to be. And... Uh, that went on to win like best sci-fi screenplay at Shriekfest many mm. years ago that I then adapted into a novel that is now available on Amazon. There's the plug. Um, Please plug away. But yeah, so re- Redacted Confessions of Eric Conspiracy Smith is about a writer who gets tangled up in the world of UFO conspiracies by making them. And what happens when they realize that what they're doing is hurting someone. How do they course correct? How do they make amends and can they? And so it was, so it's really about that process. And there are a couple of nods in the book that I learned from the optimist. There's one gap where we had done like zip codes before zip codes happened. Yes. <laughs> and I called out the book and there's one thing, there was one thing about the, um, making a reference to the arch in St. Louis before it was built and a couple, a couple of things like that. Right. That I'm like, right, right. I'm... and so I, so like little, little nods like that made, made their way into the novel about UFOs. I began this story about grandpa. Then my mom became a part of it. Even I played a role, but like grandpa's work, this story turned out to be about all of you. Those who encouraged me to keep going. Those who saw something special when I couldn't. Those who gave up so much to receive Grandpa's message. Those who believe in the future. When you talk to people about this that have never heard of it, how do you describe what this thing was? How has it evolved in your own memory over those 10 years? So I I think for me, how it's evolved has been kind of this benchmark about what I want from the work that I do in this field and, you know, having, having this emotional connection with people and being able to, being able to tell a story in a weird way and be able to watch it unfold and let it be this sort of living beast that has to, that has to push and pull with its audience and has to react to it. And it's a really, unique art form and a really unique form of storytelling. Um, and I've always been really appreciative of the, the opportunity to have worked on it and the opportunity to have contributed to it. And, um, and it kind of led to, you know, me appreciating on a much deeper level, the type of, of impact that this work can have on people. And, and I don't take that lightly. Like it means a lot that you still care after all these years, that, that your audience still cares after all these years, that something that we were kind of doing in the heat of the moment at a thousand miles an hour 
and just trying Laying to tell down the railroad track as the hundred percent exiting the station. Hundred percent, just you know, um, just trying, to, just trying to um, let it evolve and let it react. And it, it's it was a super unique opportunity, and I'm really grateful to have like I'm really grateful to have been a part of it. And I I, I did get to stretch a lot of narrative chops on it, but I cannot stress how I was just a small part of this team that brought this thing to life that, you know, it was really the, um, it was, you know, really the, the vision of, what it wanted to be that I was reacting to. And, and it, you know, I think that my natural state is cynicism and sarcasm. And it's easy. It's very easy for me to do that. <laughs> and the sincerity of this is it's pure and it's honest and it's great. And, and it was a blast. And I, I, legitimately can't believe it's been 10 years like just can't it's bonkers grandpa once said when you can take time to appreciate a sunrise it means tomorrow is here once again i'd like to thank chad jones for taking the time to join us today and as always if you have any questions or comments feel free to drop us a line on your preferred social media platform or send us an email at press at tomorrowlandtimes.com that's p-r-e-s-s at tomorrowlandtimes.com i'd like to thank everyone for visiting tomorrowland times which we will keep alive as long as humanly possible to ensure that there is always a place where dreamers and optimists can stick together. I gave, gave you a beat there for edit because I don't know if this is is, is valuable, but I love the movie. Like I just loved it. It was like it brought me such joy, and it was. It was the moment when Frank face planted with his rocket pack and went tearing through yeah. the field that I realized that it was a live action Bugs Bunny cartoon right. and I'm just on board for it. Like a hundred percent. This thing is insane and I loved it. And and it's very hard for me as a writer to sometimes turn off my screenwriter brain and enjoy a thing. And this movie reminded me of like, just shut up, nerd, and just enjoy something.